Welcome to another episode of Casual Citizen, an ongoing series about the upcoming first-person MMO Star Citizen by Cloud Imperium Games. I'm your host, Alisiana, from the Mystic Worlds Gaming Blog. Sorry about the two-week hiatus. Between work, a business trip, and being offered an exciting opportunity to narrate a small audiobook, my plate has been rather full. I was at least spared the agony of watching the pot boil waiting for 2.4 to hit the live server. Here's hoping it's not too far off. This week's episode will discuss another ship that's near and dear to my heart, the Drake Herald. It's one of only three small career ships in my lineup. The fact that I can own platform ships, ships for medium-sized groups, and engage in solo or duo activities is a huge part of what excites me about Star Citizen. I like the flexibility to control my playstyle and or dependency on other players to fit my mood or whatever I feel like accomplishing at any given time. In looking at the Herald, we'll touch on Drake as a company, the Magnus system where they're headquartered, and electronic warfare as it relates to the Herald. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Begin Transmission Most players would likely agree that the Herald isn't the prettiest or the sleekest ship in the verse. Some consider it downright ugly. For me, it falls into the so quirky that it's cute category. I find it attractive in a crooked smile kind of way. And although I prefer the original asymmetrical design, I'm not bothered by the change in direction. Those were concept images, this is Alpha, shit happens, yada. Before delving into the Herald, let's take our first look at its manufacturer, Drake Interplanetary. For many citizens, the name Drake Interplanetary conjures up images of ships whose silhouettes don't look aerodynamically balanced and the ne'er-do-wells and criminals that fly them, pirates. Drake hasn't helped change this perception by naming its ships things like Cutlass and the Buccaneer, and their cheesy billboards featuring overly endowed women dripping sex appeal all over the newest starfighter they're showcasing doesn't help much either. When you're not seeing Drake's in-your-face adverts, it's yet another news vid about investigations into their criminal ties. Drake's keystone design is the Drake Interplanetary AS-1, the Cutlass. Incredibly inexpensive, Drake Cutlasses are used across the galaxy for thousands of different roles, from search and rescue ambulances to mining prospector conversions to short hop food transports. The modular nature of the Cutlass means it can be anything to anyone, including those skirting the law. Beyond its modularity, the Cutlass's claim to fame is that it's built from common parts. This makes it an affordable ship to replace for those who are living a lifestyle that no longer offers the benefits of purchasable insurance. Drake Interplanetary incorporated soon after the success of the Cutlass. Lead designer Jan Dredge became CEO. Then there are seven board members, consisting of largely aerospace engineers who had worked on the project. Drake is not the surname of anyone who was involved in the project. It was selected as an acceptably smooth-sounding name, chosen specifically in the hopes that it would make their spacecraft more appealing. This was the first series of money-over-all decisions that would quickly come to define this company. Another factor swaying the UEE's belief that Drake is in some fashion associated with criminal activity was their decision to locate their corporate headquarters and key factories on Borea in the Magnus system. At the time, Magnus was a desolate and lawless system, peppered with ghost towns and people living on the fringe of outer space. Locating on Borea was yet another seed planted in the garden of their outlaw image. Regardless of the UEE's assumption or the feelings of those in more polite society, within five years, Drake was the fifth largest space manufacturing concern. However, with the galaxy in a relative level of peace, or as close to peace as it had ever been, 
Vandal raids at the time were disorganized, and the UEE military was in the middle of a several-year stand-down. Who was buying thousands upon thousands of cutlasses? The answer, of course, pirate organizations. The affordability of Drake ships created readily replaceable spacecraft that fit a pirate's budget. And thanks to its larger-than-average cargo hull, they could also transport pirate booty. Even to Drake, it eventually became clear, though not publicly acknowledged, that Drake had made a deal with the devil. But the money was too good to turn back. It's rumored that in looking forward to the future, CEO Dredge is authoring a plan to streamline their spacecraft lineup and clean up the company's image. A daunting task for that modular boxy cutlass, caterpillar, and buccaneer. And then there's those ship names. Only time will tell. Life in Magnus. Directly from CIG. Magnus on the edge of the unknown, or so reads the local government's standard travel brochure. In truth, the phrase better describes Magnus a century ago. Recent decades have seen increasing settlement and overall civilization in a system that still considers itself the unofficial capital of the human frontier culture. End quote. First discovered in 2499, Magnus was a small, entirely undistinguished system. Three planets orbiting a Type K main sequence star. Dimmer than Earth's own sun, Magnus did not have the pull to generate a system of outer planets or an extensive network of jump point tie-ins. Surveys have located no protoplanets, gas pockets, or asteroid fields in the system's environs. The area surrounding Magnus is the deepest, most desolate space imaginable. A single world, Magnus II, was identified as ideal for terraforming. For a time, Boria, Magnus II, was a barren, desert world. The effects of terraforming had not yet completely transformed the planet, and a 10-year period of extreme solar flares hampered its transition to a temperate world. This increased the decay of UEE facilities and generally reduced overall interest in resettling Magnus. The result was an eerie, depopulated ghost world with declining structures full of refining and shipbuilding equipment considered too expensive to move elsewhere. During this period, the system's population declined to less than 3,000, most of whom had no legal right to their encampments. Let's take a step back for a moment to consider living on a planet whose entire population is 3,000 inhabitants. It has to feel something like living in a post-apocalyptic world or being on a backwater planet in Firefly where Jane is worshipped as a deity. I think I'll pass, but Drake said, sure, sounds good to us. Drake's decision to locate their headquarters and primary factories on Boria eventually helped to revitalize the landscape. Vast tracts of empty warehouses and rusting construction yards have been modernized and returned to life. All's well that ends well and good on Drake. But personally, I would have started job hunting when news came around about where the offices were going to be located. The Drake Interplanetary Herald. An overview. The original concept sale for the Herald was in November 2014. The Herald is a small armored ship designed to safely deliver information and you from one place to the next. Its speed will rival racers, but it won't have the same nimble handling. It has a powerful central engine to support advanced data encryption. It also sports data protection systems, redundant power subsystems, EMP shielding, and high-capacity broadcast arrays for data transmission. In a nutshell, it's spec to acquire rare data, encrypt or protect it, escape with said data, and or transport it to your cohorts. As a fallback, it has a quick method to clear your drives of evidence in case you get caught in the act or hijacked. Ship Configuration the Herald is classified as an info runner. It's 23 meters in length and weighs approximately 18,000 kilograms. 
It supports two cruise stations and zero cargo units. For Hardpoint, it's configured with three size one gimbal mounts and a size three shield and one additional equipment mount. A bit of Drake related fiction from robertspaceindustries.com. Dispatch, a new threat to data security by Drake Interplanetary. Subject, Drake Herald data, status urgent. Attention team, attached to this dispatch are the final specifications and 3D holo model of what you have worked all these long months to accomplish. Our Herald prototype will now enter the construction and testing phase with a planned Q2 2945 rollout for the first sales units. On the surface, the Herald represents a significant advance in interstellar data transfer. But as we Drake team members know, its long-term implications for data interception, stream interruption, and even outright piracy are enormous. I'm proud of everything we've accomplished, and now I can't wait to see this baby fly. Signed, Beck Lins, Senior Spacecraft Designer, Drake Interplanetary. End quote. In that final paragraph, we can see that Drake's intention of cleaning up their act is only surface level, a little spit and shine on the old public image. Clearly, they understand and acknowledge the potential ramifications of their designs, but decide to move forward with introducing this type of technology into the market. A quick chat about electronic warfare. In August of 2015, CIG published a design document discussing their plans for implementing electronic warfare, often abbreviated to E-War. E-War mechanics played such a heavy role in EVE Online combat that I've been very interested in learning more about how it will play out in Star Citizen. Oftentimes in EVE, you can lose a fight before you've undocked from a station simply by not having your ship adequately configured for an encounter. Will E-War and Star Citizen have the same far-reaching impacts? It will be quite some time before we can answer that question. Let's review the portion of the Star Citizen E-War design document that speaks to capabilities we can expect to see incorporated into the Herald as an interceptor of information. Radar Object Detection and Scanning the Drake Herald is an information runner, but it includes a dedicated E-War suite, which includes the ability to scan. Scanning is the tracking or gathering of information based off of three main signature outputs, infrared, electromagnetic, and cross-section. Every ship has a suite of default systems that give it basic operational functionality. Our radar systems use IR, EM, or radio waves to determine range, angle, and the velocity of objects. Standard operating mode for radar systems is omnidirectional. However, players with the right equipment can change the focus of their unit. Changing the focus increases the transmission power, but reduces the area in which the targets can be located. Scan and radar effectiveness are also impacted by the environment. For example, solar radiation from nearby stars can wreak havoc on your results. The goal is to introduce variance in performance between radar components and require choices from the player as to what type of information they value above others, as well as reduce the time of a scan and or the risk of being detected. Players will have the ability to scan their surroundings either passively or actively. Passive, the player is letting information come to them versus actively searching for information. In essence, you're in listening mode. This emits a much smaller signature. Active, the player's ship is actively looking for information around the ship. This emits a much higher signature. In passive scanning, the range and the detection type is based off of the radar component that your ship has installed. Any potentially targetable objects within your ship's radar zone will show up as different context states, discussed in the detailed design doc. This feature will emit a signature when turned on. 
It will be up to the player to choose if they want scans to run consistently or enable during certain times. Multi-cruise ships can assign this as a full-time task to our radar officer, allowing them to balance scanning systems with the ship's signature output. By switching to active scanning, you can acquire more specific information on a target, such as their type of armor, shields, weapons, etc. You can even attempt to reveal undetectable targets. This can be done with a focus set to either Omni or Fixed Direction, with Fixed Direction requiring more skill to use but potentially producing a more detailed output. Active scanning will also increase a ship's signature since it requires additional power. To stay safe from hacking and electronic warfare attacks, pilots will need to outfit their ship and their flight suits with appropriate countermeasures. Electronic defenses require less specialized equipment than their offensive counterparts. And while this does favor defenders to an extent, they can still be met with multiple attacks and overwhelmed. This is just the tip of the iceberg for electronic warfare. Please read the full design document for more details, including the defensive mechanisms players will have at their disposal to minimize and or negate the offensive effectiveness of e-war attacks. Tying it all together. Understanding that the Herald was designed to intercept data, a fancy way of saying stealing, we can imagine that as part of the gameplay. I think there will be opportunities to hijack information from ship systems, structures with data storage capabilities, and possibly even Moby devices. If we also consider that it has a dedicated e-war suite, that introduces offensive combat mechanics. Acting as a scout, the Herald can gather information about primary targets and relay that data back to the fleet. It may be possible for it to disable certain subsystems. This inches us closer to the aspects of how e-war plays out in EVE Online. Exciting times and sounds like very interesting gameplay mechanics for a small two-station ship. I cannot wait to try it out. I liked the idea of the Herald before we had the EWAR design document. My primary decision for purchasing one was to have another two-station ship. Although I'll probably do a lot of this work solo since I enjoy that too, I'm hoping to introduce friends to Star Citizen who don't traditionally play MMOs but are interested in space. And it's another non-combat focused activity I can do with younger kids in the family. Show Notes I hope you've enjoyed this look into the Herald and Drake Interplanetary. Please check out the show notes on my blog for links to mention content such as the Herald ship page, Drake's write-up on RSI, and the Magnus Galactic Guide. If you found this episode useful and entertaining, please consider subscribing to my channel and giving the show a thumbs up. It would be greatly appreciated, and doing so helps the show's visibility, making it easier for others to find their way here. As ever, be kind and fly safe. This is Alisiana signing off until next time. End transmission.